Welcome everyone to our webinar from the Master of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities program. We're going to talk about different program outcomes and so we're really excited to get started. Um, I'm, my name's Sam. I work with the Enrollment Management Office in the School of Medicine and I'll be your moderator for this program today and I'll get to go over the agenda with you, how to do the Q&A portion, and then I will send it off to my two lovely panelists. Uh, so we're we're going to talk about the Case Western School of Medicine first, uh, talk about the different portions within that, uh, go into the MA in Bioethics and Medical Humanities program, and then we're going to get into the meat of, and potatoes of today's program, talking about those program outcomes and different students that have gone off to do different really neat things. And then at the end of the program, we'll talk about the application process and deadlines, so that way you can potentially join us in the coming cohorts. And then at the end, we'll go into a Q&A. And then with that Q&A, you're going to want to send all of your uh, questions through the actual Q&A feature. So if you're on a desktop, that'll be at the bottom of your screen. It'll look like two chat bubbles on top of one another. And then you can send all your questions through there. Or if you're on mobile, you'll just click to the top left. There should be three lines and it'll drop down to give you the Q&A button itself. Without further ado, though, I will introduce our two panelists. So we have Marie Norris, who is our graduate program coordinator, and Dr. Leah Jeanette, who is our assistant director of education and a research, a senior research associate. Uh, Marie and Dr. Jeanette, take it away. Marie, I will let you um, introduce yourself a little bit more if you'd like. Sure. Boy, this picture is so bad, guys. I look so much better in person. <laughs> I'm Marie Norris, and I've been here for over 20 years, and probably have seen close to 700 students come through our program and successfully move on into other endeavors. Um, it's an exciting program, one of the best in the country, if I must say, and in fact, a lot of programs are kind of designed like our program. So our students come in, and they learn so much and they go off into other exciting fields and they keep in touch. I talked to three already this morning alums. So um, that's a little bit about me and what I do. And Leah, it's your turn. Sure, so I um, am actually an alum of the program. Um, I first met Marie when I was a student. Um, so, of those three that she talked to this morning, I am not one of those, although we did talk this morning. <laughs> um, so I have been um, in the Department of Bioethics for five years now. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Education. I work with um, incoming students. Um, I work primarily in the master's program, um, overseeing our clinical ethics rotations. Um, I also teach my own course in adolescent health and bioethics and I'm a clinical ethicist at one of the hospitals here in Cleveland University Hospitals. Um, I am very excited to be um, talking today about the program outcomes. And I think one of the great things about the master's program in particular, but also about the world of bioethics and medical humanities is because it's so interprofessional and interdisciplinary, and we'll talk a little bit about this, um, is that it allows students and alums and our faculty and staff and kind of those who are in this kind of field and world to come from a variety of viewpoints and areas of expertise and then go off into a variety of places and expertise. And so I think that's what makes it so exciting um, is to hear why students are interested in bioethics and medical humanities and then where they um, plan to go next. Um, so I'll get us started with talking a little bit about Case Western Reserve University and primarily the School of Medicine. So our department is based in the School of Medicine. Our School of Medicine is ranked number one in Ohio. Um, we're in the top 25 for School of Medicines in the country. Um, the law school is ranked very high, particularly our health law program is ranked, I believe, number eight. Um, the nursing program at Case is ranked very high. The doctorate of nursing program is usually in the top 10, um, if not the top five um, some years. Um, the social work program is ranked very highly, um, as well as the business school. 
And the reason why we don't just highlight the School of Medicine, we have dual degree programs with a lot of these schools and other programs. And so um, students have the opportunity to either participate in these dual degree programs, or they have the opportunity to take electives in these, um, in these schools or in these other departments. So there's a lot of collaboration going on. The other thing I will highlight um, that we do in the School of Medicine is a lot of research in addition to the educational pieces. And be, that research that's going on um, is really incorporated into kind of the educational initiatives that are going on. And that research is not just funded through the NIH, but also through NSF. And there are multi-million dollar, multi-year grants um, that are done at Case Western Reserve, but also through our affiliate hospitals and it's really exciting cutting edge work that is going on. And bioethics and medical humanities is a part of that, which we are really um, thrilled to be included on a lot of that work. So one of the questions we're often asked is why study bioethics and medical humanities? And I know I was asked this when I, decided to do this program, like, why are you studying this area? And, you know, it comes back to, there's a lot of advancement in science and technology and medicine, and this can lead to significant questions, to these kind of large and big questions. Should we intervene? Can we intervene? But then the next question becomes, can we ensure justice? Can we ensure respect for persons? in research and in clinical practice? And then what kind of value should inform policy and practice if we're trying to ensure justice and respect for persons? And that can be really challenging as we've seen very significantly over the last almost two years now. How do we go about doing that? And it's been very clearly demonstrated that we do not agree with the people even within our own households or in our own families or in our communities. And so these big questions um, are really hard to work through. And bioethics and medical humanities is a great place to start to think about these things. And so then ultimately, how does bioethics and medical humanities help your career path? So bioethics and medical humanities, as I mentioned before, is very interprofessional. It's very multidisciplinary, both in its origin and in its practice. And so those of us who are in these um, fields, in these disciplines, come at it from different lenses. So folks can be philosophers, physicians, nurses, theologians. There's a lot of different places that they can start from. Social workers, psychologists, I mean, the list is is kind of endless, anthropologists, I, I could just keep listing all different places and professions and disciplines. And because of that, um, it lends itself to, because of its origin, but it lends itself to its practice to be that way as well. And so it allows the study of and the practice of bioethics and medical humanities to continue to be that way. And so therefore we can help launch students into a variety of professional careers. And you can see here, including clinical and legal professions, research and regulatory work, arts and humanities, bioethics, public health and other academic professions. And I think the one that um, I think in particular our program can do really well is discernment for the undecided. Um, and we really focus on that flexibility within our program. Um, so Marie, I'm gonna turn this over to you to talk a little bit um, on how our program is structured and kind of the exciting things that we offer in our program, um, including celebrating 26 years for our master's program. Yes, yes. Well, uh, a good number of the students come full time, uh, many during a gap year, and it's two semesters. Um, some students are here three years um, as they are in dual degree programs or part time. Uh, we have personalized advising for each student. Uh, and, and that's really key is, I mean, you work one on one with, with the faculty and they're here for you. 
And I, I really love that about this department, how available each and every faculty member is to students. Um, 13.5 um, to 30 credits are electives and 160 hours of clinical ethics rotations, which is 80 hours each semester. And that's, uh, students love it. It's amazing. There's like four hospital systems and you get two of them. Um, Short-term study abroad electives, that's a big, big, big part of this. And we have students not even in the program who take these courses. Um, two concentrations, medicine, society, and culture, and research ethics, and competitive student assistantships to offset tuition. And that really helps. A lot of programs don't offer this uh, for master's students, but ours do. So it's, it's very, very solid. Um, so what else, Dr. Jeanette, would you like me to say about this? You know, the, the one other thing I will add is, you know, these are just, you know, some of the very significant highlights um, of the program. Um, the, when I, when the other thing I will add is, you know, our program is one of the first master's programs. And so we've had a long time to work with our students to find out what works and what doesn't work, um, to get really good feedback from our students and to really create a program that um, can help students in figuring out how to incorporate bioethics and medical humanities into their career path, into the next step um, to create the best possible program outcome for them. Um, and, to, and to think about how this program kind of fits into their overall all career path. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the like broad areas that students think about when coming into our program. So we're gonna talk a little bit about students who come to the program thinking about a career possibly in the law, um, possibly in healthcare, students who think about a career in maybe research, um, students who think about some type of career of going into graduate school. And that could be, there's a whole list of types of career options in that regard. And then um, non-traditional students as well. So, you know, in, in kind of thinking about our alums in the program, um, when Marie and I, when Marie and I were kind of preparing for this, and Marie, you made a reference that you've seen over 700 students come through. Right trying to narrow this down. <laughs> I know. Um, can, is, is a little overwhelming. Um, so, you know, talking about our alums who really wanted to pursue law, you know, through our program, through the lens of law and the intersection of bioethics, medical humanities and law. Can you talk a little bit about Mara who did our program? Yeah, sure. Mara, you know, when I think of Mara, she's unbelievably smart and talented, but I think of her as a the person who's knew how to buy the best bargains and go to these resale shops and would come in and show me the things that she found. I mean, it was just amazing. But Mara was a great, great student and she had a research job while she was in the program. I still remember her in the office across from mine. Um, she went on to Columbia and then she worked in a couple of law firms, and she currently is a healthcare attorney at a huge major hospital here in the city. Um, just, just amazing, but not just a good student. Not our students aren't good students, but you're kind of like part of our family, and you, you're always a part of, even after you leave. So that's, I get that connection with the students is, you know, you're, you belong here. We want you here and we'll do everything we can to help you and watch you grow and succeed in life. So yeah, our students have gone on to Notre Dame, Suffolk, University of Maryland. Uh, I, I mean, just, just all over Columbia. Uh, we had a student, yeah, she, she went on to Harvard Law School, uh, Deborah, in fact. And it's amazing how they just pop out of my head or when I open a file drawer, I see them and I see where they've gone on to. And it, it's, just, it's just amazing how they grow and, and flourish. Yeah. So, you know, and I think 
one of the great things about the way that our program is structured is because of the way our electives work, they can take electives that focus on that intersection of law and ethics, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the health law concentration is a very, very, very strong course. Uh, even law and psychiatry. Uh, typically, students come in and they, they, they say, well, I'm thinking about law, but I'm not sure about law. And our students can take electives from across the university. So someone thinking about law, we go to the electives at the law school and they take these courses. And we actually have adjunct faculty at the law school too, who welcome the bioethics students. So they, they take maybe health law concentration one in the fall and then law concentration two in the spring. And it kind of gives them a feel for, you know, do I want to actually go into law? And a number of them do decide to do that. I think part of it is, you know, actually going in and, and taking the law courses while in our program. Absolutely. You know, that, that kind of also makes me think of um, some of our faculty actually do grants and do research work with some of the law faculty as well. You know, there's a lot of collaboration between the law school faculty and the bioethics faculty as well. And sometimes students even get the opportunity to work alongside them on some of those projects too. So um, the other thing I will say is, you know, some students that are interested in law may not go on to law school, but they end up going into more of a health policy interest. So they may get a master's or a doctorate in health policy, maybe work in the public sector or even public health. And so they still have an interest in law, but they may go about that in a different way. So there's a lot of ways that they can pursue law um, after the program. Oh, I have something else to add to just thinking about it. We have students that have gone to the law school, graduated, went on, and then they send emails back and they say, Marie, this is a great opportunity for students, our students to come and to fill these slots. And it would be like year after year after year. And someone at one of the conferences asked, how come so many of our CWRU students actually come and fill these slots at, at you know, fellowships and certain summer internships? And it's because the alums, they go out and they send word back. And so then we send applicants and, and it's amazing. It, it, that just amazes me. The opportunity you get while you know, being in a strong program. Yeah. So, Moving forward, let's talk about alums that are pursuing health care. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, Joseph, who graduated from our program in 2018? Yes, Joseph. Boy, I could hear his voice now. He has such a strong voice. Uh, Joe, he, he was a great student, too, and a great person. Uh, but he couldn't get into medical school, um, or he didn't, wasn't admitted right away. So he came to our program, and I remember he came in and he said five medical schools wanted him. I mean, great medical schools, too. So he chose the Mayo Clinic. That was the best uh, option for him, and he's doing fine. I haven't heard from him lately. I think, I bet he's very, very busy, but he is always um, in our hearts, and, in, and we think about him often, and I should reach out to him. But the students have gone on to Drexel, Columbia, NYU, Ohio State, you know, Cincinnati, Wisconsin, Johns Hopkins, CWRU, the Cleveland Clinic's Learner College of Medicine, where they do a lot of research medicine. And it, it's just amazing, even internationally. Uh, they're all over the world in medical schools, and it, it just amazes me. Japan, the islands, uh, Australia. So these are all our alums. So yeah, you, you come, you grow, and you go. Absolutely. And it, you know, for each student, it may not specifically be med school. We have students who come to the program, and they want to be physician assistants, they want to um, go into nursing or nurse practitioner. They want to be social workers. Um, they may specific, we've had students who specifically want to go to MD schools or DO schools. And so, you know, each student is unique in the direction they want to go. Um, it's always exciting when our students, you know, find out that they've got into the med school of their choice or the 
you know, nursing school of their choice, um, or even when we hear back from them and they're in the process of applying. My, my favorite is when they email us and they're like, I'm in the process of applying for residency. And during my residency interview, all they wanted to talk about was my master's degree in bioethics. <laughs> I love to hear that. And they're like, even in my residency interviews, it stood out. <laughs> that part always makes me laugh <laughs> and be so and be so excited for them. Um, but again, it's another example of why this program is so unique. It stands out um, and it really helps shape students as they think about what comes next. And you know, as someone who works as a clinical ethicist in the hospital, for people who are going to be in the clinical world, I consistently tell them it is not going to be a matter of if you come across a clinical ethics issue, it's a matter of when you come across a clinical ethics issue. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And being prepared and being knowledgeable in this, in having the skills to know how to work through it is, is going to be invaluable to you. So, yeah. So it's, it's always great to hear, you know, where our students have gone on to um, after the program. All right, so continuing to push ahead. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about Reed who is at the University of Texas. Yes, Reed, University of Texas. And, and he was, Reed was really, really special. He was um, very much a part of his uh, Native American culture. And he found a group here in Cleveland and they met on Fridays, Cherokee, and they had dinner and he would come in and speak Cherokee language to me. Um, but just amazing. So not only was he a great student, he was just a great person all around, like so many of the others. Um, but he's doing his um, University of Texas PhD in so sociology. What is it? What kind of studies is it? So I think his focus in sociology um, has a connection between um, indigenous people and health. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's his particular area. Um, and his advisor, I think, is exactly what you talked about, Marie. It has to do um, with his own background as well. So I think it's fantastic, the work yeah. he's doing. And he's connecting it to bioethics as well. Exactly. Great diversity there. Yeah. Um, I will say that, you know, a lot of our students have gone on to master's and PhDs. And again, this is just a small sampling of the variety of degrees um, that they have gone on to, including myself. Um, I went on and got a PhD in healthcare ethics um, and the variety of universities that they've gone on to um, in working both private and public sectors, not-for-profit and academia. And again, you know, one of the things we, we continue to highlight is, you know, because our faculty are so diverse in their own areas of expertise and their own educational backgrounds, whether or not they're your own advisors, your academic advisors, our faculty are really great at being able to sit down with students and talk to students about what they wanna get out of the program and how um, their own career path can move forward. And right. so it's a great opportunity to sit with the faculty and say, you know, this is what my interests are. This is where I think I wanna go and be able to help, you know, navigate that and kind of understand it better. And, you know, Fig figuring out what comes next and do that through planning out your courses, but also doing that through, you know, figuring out just, you know, how to, how to make a plan for what comes next. So our faculty are really, really helpful with that. So let's talk a little bit about alums who want to pursue a career in research. Marie, you want to talk a little bit about Megan? Yeah, Megan, she's now over at the clinic. And uh, so many of our students get the opportunity to go to such great places. But she, again, another super student um, from Pennsylvania. And she is a neuroethics researcher. And it, it's just amazing how they come in and they just grow and they go. And I was so happy to learn that she was at the clinic. I thought she went back to Pennsylvania. And when I found out, I was like, oh my gosh, she's, she's so close. 
So yeah, students are, are alum, I should say, are everywhere. It, it's just amazing. With 700, you're, you're bound to run into them. Um, but yeah, our, our research is, I don't know if Megan did the research ethics track. Did she? I don't think she did, but I know through the program, she discovered her love of neuroethics. Mm. Um, and that's really what got her interested. And that's how she um, ended up doing kind of neuroethics research um, was through this program. Yeah, it's amazing how they, they go on. I mean, we, we have students that have gone on to do research at MIT, Northwestern, UCLA, Stanford, the clinic, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, University of Colorado, even at CWRU. I mean, they are just everywhere. Other countries, I'm not even going into where they're at in other countries, but they are in other countries too. Yeah, and I will say, you know, you know that list of all the different ways that students or alumni do research or the different types of projects or the different roles they fill. I know there could be some overlap, right? You can be on a grant and do qualitative or quantitative, right? So all those descriptions can kind of overlap in a myriad of ways. Um, but it's, it's amazing to see how they do that. And for those who are particularly interested in pursuing kind of research, um, as Marie mentioned, we have our research ethics concentration and this allows students to really do a deep dive in research. And it's focusing on the research ethics issues in research and the research ethics issues of research. So you're, you're looking at both of those issues and it's a fantastic way to really think about the ethical issues um, in that area because there's so many things to think about. Um, students get a core course of research ethics and regulations. There's a research ethics journal club that you participate in. And then there's a research ethics practicum that you do in a, the spring semester, which gets you embedded either in an IRB or with a research team. And you come up with a project to work on, um, which is a fantastic opportunity for students. And then kind of the last category we're gonna talk about is what we call non-traditional alums. Um, and so then the last student we kind of want to talk about our alum is Glenn, um, who graduated in 2019. And he actually came to us as a chaplain in the military. Yeah, Glenn is, uh, he was out in Colorado and a chaplain. And I guess the military each year will send two chaplains uh, to, to do a master's in bioethics program. And uh, a number of them, was interested in our program and how and why. It's because other chaplains told them about our program. Um, but Glenn, just great, just great, just great. Um, he completed the program full time, one year, and, and that's what the military wanted. And um, they really wanted him to come back. And in fact, we were gonna get another one this year, but he was sent to Kuwait and he had to defer. So Glenn came and did the program full time. And from what I understand, he was an excellent student. He was, I, I had him in class. He was yeah. excellent. It's great. Yeah, so we've had a, a, num a number of non-traditional alums, um, retired physicians or attorneys or school teachers, social workers. And, and what we mean by non-traditional is like they're right, not right out of undergrad. And they give so much because they've experienced so much. And yet they yeah. get so much from, you know, being in, in classes with, with people in their 20s. So, yeah, would you like to add on to this, Dr. Jeanette? You know, the other thing I will say is, um, you know, th these, are, these are individuals who, you know, whether they're doing it full time or part time, you know, we really sit down and consider, you know, their unique situation and how to make the program work, um, especially those who need to do it part time and figure out what kind of schedule they need um, and how to figure out the part time situation. Um, but I will say we've even had physicians who are full time physicians do the program part time over a number of years mm -hmm. um, to make it work. It's amazing to me. They're, you know, in the morning, they're doing they're doing rounds and they're attending, and in the evening they're in class. And I can't even imagine trying to keep that schedule. So, <laughs> to me, that's impressive. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, so you know, giving all these different examples of 
where our students, um, what they come to the program for, and then where they go on to next, I think really um, gives the example of kind of the variety and the diversity of what our program offers and why this interprofessional multidisciplinary world of bioethics and medical humanities is so unique. Um, I think it's just one of the great things about bioethics and medical humanities. Um, so, you know, just kind of to wrap up our time here, um, I just really quickly want to go over application requirements for those who are interested. Um, all of this can be found on our website. Um, our required materials, um, as you can see here, include a transcript from undergrad and grad program, statement of purpose, CV resume, two letters of recommendation, including one from a faculty and professor. Um, once we have a completed application, um, it's reviewed and then interviewed by admissions committee members, and we can usually render a decision within two weeks. Um, one of the big things that we mentioned earlier was our student assistantships. For, so um, these are quite competitive, but they are opportunities for students to be involved in research, teaching, or administrative activities with faculty and staff. They're based both on need and or merit. Um, Determ they're determined by those. Um, you can be awarded partial tuition waivers anywhere between three and twelve thousand um, dollars. You have to submit a master's program application in order to be eligible, and these applications will open sometime in January. Um, for those who have submitted a master's program application, you'll automatically get an email um, when the application opens to apply for this. And then the question that always comes up is deadline. So our first major priority one deadline this year is December 1st. For those who submit by December 1, um, provided it is a completed application, um, including like letters of rec have been submitted and everything, um, we can render a decision by the end of the year. Um, for um, integrated graduate studies students, so those are current juniors at Case Western Reserve. Their application deadline is March 1. Priority two deadline is May 15th. So if you want to submit a student assistantship dead, if you want to submit a student assistantship application, you have to submit um, your application by May 15th. Um, and then our final program deadline is August 1st for a, an August 2020 start date. Um, so all of that being said, um, we do want to open it up for questions. I know we um, are at the end of our time, but if anyone has any questions they want to submit to the Q&A, we are happy to um, entertain those questions. Um, so while folks are typing in their questions, um, Marie, do you have any final um, things you want to share with our attendees? Yes, uh, it's a great program, uh, great faculty and staff. And oh, students have fun inside and outside. There's student groups, you get together with other grad programs and clubs, and there's always so much going on. There's great talks, conversations, works in progress, lunch with the faculty. I mean, it, it's amazing how much you will learn um, at your time here with, with the bioethics department at CWRU, um, let us know if you have any questions. Yes, if you have any questions at all, you can always email us, bioethics at case.edu. Um, it's, you know, no question is too small to ask. Um, we're happy to chat with you um, about the program, any way that we can um, assist you, um, you know, in the application process or, finding out more about the master's program. So if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up, but thank you so much for attending and we thank hope you have a good rest of your day.